this is just the, the first session that we have with the great talks, which is an idea that we discussed at our executive committee. How to, we had a meeting, a virtual meeting, and actually we said, well, instead of just discussing how are you, how is the family, and you're feeling well, let's start doing something substantive and having some kind of contribution. And since the, the time is really for reflection in every sense, how the fragility of life, the fragility that we feel of the globalization as we know it, the fragility of structures, the fragility of regional agreements, fragilities that really push us really very much to rethink. And so we said we don't really have to be body to body, face to face in, in a meeting. We can start that, that process and contribute to that thinking, having people from all over the world. Now, what better place to start that in Singapore with Carolina Rodriguez, she was here in Geneva. She was the starter and the first director of the Perception Change Program in Geneva, which really contributed very much to the change of perceptions and to making bridges, building bridges between the international community and the local community. And also Mohan Paniker from, from Montal, with a vast experience all over the world and now seeing the crisis and the crisis from a different perspective. So welcome just uh, 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 Manuela who contacted Carolina and Mohan. We chaired the session actually, she will introduce uh, the subject. It's something that she discussed with Carolina and, and Mohan. And we will be interacting requesting the floor through our chat list that you have on the bottom of your skin. So everybody very welcome to to this first session and well let's start. Virginia. Okay so good morning everybody again and thank you for participating in this first chat. Uh, we, we wanted to choose a topic because that organizes a little bit the conversation, but that doesn't prevent us to exchange jokes and uh, everything else outside the topic because this is not an academic setting. Let's be very clear about that. Uh, and I thought that uh, from the Singapore perspective, so, so from Carolina and Mohan, uh, current experience in Singapore, uh, the topic of the privacy and uh, the control from the authorities, the government, on your movements uh, to try to confine the, 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 the virus is a topic that is uh, coming here in Europe more and more in the news, precisely because they look at Singapore experience, it's not the only one in China also, of course, but they look at the Singapore experience uh, saying, could that sort of measures of controlling, uh, for instance, through mobile phones uh, and applying very severe restrictions to your movements, uh, could that really be uh, applicable within the legislative and political framework of democracies in Europe? And precisely now, a few minutes ago, before we started this chat, uh, there is a, an article on the independent, on the British newspaper independent where there are some statements from the UN representatives on privacy uh, saying that um, in the time of crisis like this one it is always a good opportunity for a dictatorship to, to, to start and as you probably know a few days ago we saw that in Hungary uh, the, the guy Mr. Orban took advantage of the crisis to say now I have uh, full powers uh, even beyond the time of crisis. So this sort of alerts that come from a democratic mindset, mindset are becoming the, a hot debate uh, in many, many places, in UK, also in the US, they are just starting. And will, I think, in the next few weeks become a really a hot, a hot potato. So I wanted to know from your Singapore real life, daily life experience, how you see this debate when you know perfectly well what is the European mindset and uh, what you could tell us in practical and political terms. So over to Carolina and Mohan. Carolina, open your mic because your mic is closed. <laughs> All right. Great. There we go. Can you, uh, sh shall I start on Mohan? Do you want to 
do you want to get started or do I start? Yeah, go ahead, Calvin, uh, please. Okay, I'll go. So thank you so much for, for, the, for inviting me. It's so nice to see you, so many of you again. And yeah, this is such a, such a lovely initiative and it's like timely and, and, and yeah, and I guess re very much relevant. I'd say that um, from a, as, 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 a, as an ordinary citizen, the, I, think, I think the vast majority of the people here are actually feeling very relieved that the situation here has been overall managed in a, in a, in a very efficient way. I don't feel that restrictions have been, um, have been imposed in a way that anyone's felt that their freedoms have been curtailed in any way. Um, when, the, when the government rolled out the app, but for tracing last week, um, it does obviously say, you know, they're not collecting personal data and it's really just to help um, enhance all the, the, the a very efficient contact tracing that Singapore has done from, from the beginning. And I think by and large, everyone is very supportive of all the measures that have been taking place. And because the big scare in Singapore happened after Chinese New Year, because this is when you had all the tourists coming from China and a lot of people from Singapore going. And Singapore was the place with more coronavirus um, cases next to China. I think that created like a, an, an immediate reaction. So when in February, this was like the scariest place to be. And very, very quickly, everything evolved in the rest of the world and Singapore became almost like, okay, this is the, the, almost the best place to be. Um, we haven't had those lockdowns. My, the only thing that happened for me personally is that now there, people are working from home. The kids' school, the Easter break was brought forward one week and they're going back to school on Monday. Uh, they're asking people to, you know, just be a little bit more, you know, cautious when you're going outside but everything is fully functional. And I, and I know that a lot of the debate is also going around, like, are you going to, are you going to care about the health and you know, people living, or are you gonna care about the economy? I, I do think that um, that conversation here also hasn't been taken to that extreme where one thing is absolutely you know, being preferred at the expense of, of the other. Um, I'll leave it right there for now. I'll let, uh, <laughs> go let Mohan jump in and then we can, yeah, we can elaborate. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. And thank you for, for organizing this, uh, 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 this session. I think it's, it's an important moment to actually get together and knock our heads together to see what's, what's happening, <clears throat> what's fake news and what's useful news so that we can share this and we can actually try and influence other other groups, other clusters as to what is going on and what can be done. So uh, to start the session, firstly, this is all my personal views. Uh, having lived here uh, involuntarily for the last four months because I'm kind of stuck in Singapore and I couldn't get on the flight to Geneva. <coughs> uh, <coughs> sorry. But a lot of what Carolina said is true. And uh, I'll just add a little bit to the background that we, we were mostly affected immediately because Many people from Wuhan live and work in Singapore. And during the Chinese New Year period, two weeks before, a lot of them came to Singapore as tourists, as visiting their family members here. That's why we had the influx of all these people from Wuhan. And many of them brought the virus with them. They didn't know they were, they were, they were ill. So that's why there was this uh, sudden spike. And to give a little more context, because Singapore <clears throat> was already alerted of the virus in China, in Wuhan, uh, and because they had learned from their very difficult lesson of SARS about 20 years ago, they were immediately able to actually impose the isolation, the stay home notices and the quarantine issues almost immediately. Um, and I will discuss a little later how this works uh, uh, when, we, when we get there. And all of this worked <clears throat> very, very well with the government getting really the cooperation of just about everyone in the, in the country. <clears throat> in parenthesis, those who don't cooperate are in, probably are fined. <laughs> but more or less, this is what uh, has happened. And in terms of whether this have impinged on people's rights, um, there are so many angles to take this from and let me give you from a personal angle uh, and just one little aspect 
if I had to choose between my right and my life, I would choose my life and I leave my hands, my, my life in the hands of the Singapore government right now. Because in spite of, uh, we've been almost three, three and a half months into the crisis, <clears throat> the community transmission in Singapore is so weak <clears throat> in the sense that, as Carolina had said, the contact tracing, the isolation and the quarantine effects have been so good that people feel safe here. Some people panic, that's almost always, always happens, but some people feel safe here. There's a lot of confidence in what the government is doing and there's a lot of pride in what the government is doing because when we watch our neighbors to the north, Malaysia and to the south, Indonesia, uh, we are worried now that while we may have contained this, uh, our borders are not so tight. And what is happening in Indonesia and Malaysia is very, very worrying. And there will be a second wave of infections coming through the borders for sure. And we think it's going to happen sooner or later, sooner than later. So I'll stop here to see whether anybody has, if you want to ask questions about how you want to, how you see the situation, I'll be glad to answer. Uh, uh, or Carol and I, of course. Can, can I can I just add something just to like get get on a little bit on the human rights hook again? I mean, if you also look at how how this was dealt with in in South Korea and Taiwan where also there was all this use of technology. And of course, every time you have anything that feels sur surveillance -y, all of the human rights groups are going to like, you know, voice their, some concern. But I'd say like one of the, like in the aftermath, you know, as Mohan was saying, most people will prefer to, you know, be, be, feel safer than if somebody has their private details because everybody's private details are pretty much already online. They're already held by a big corporation. So whether it's a corporation or a government for the average person, it's not a big difference. What has have, what really has been an issue in terms of like, um, you know, violation of privacy that has had like repercussions, I think for the people is the, when their private information has been, um, has been leaked and it's how the society has managed to you know react to them like the the stigma around get catching um covid and this is something again that if you have like a government that's responding in an effective way and has people like well informed that is managed in a in a way that doesn't create you know more damage and i think that has been one of the biggest issues like what 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 happens when when regular people don't know how to respect you know the rights of people that have been infected and start isolating them. I think that is, a, is an issue that there was a story of a guy in Africa that they used his picture for something that went viral. And there were people like trying to kill him because the, 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 uh, the fake news was saying that he had, he had driven some people and he was infected. And this, these, these issues have been yeah, much more serious than the implications of the government asking people to download an app. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Carolina. I, I think we can take some questions or comments or whatever you feel you should say. And uh, I don't know, Alejandro, do you have something already? Yeah, yes, I, I already have a question. If, if Carolina or Mohan would like to elaborate a little bit. You have mentioned the reactions of the civil society of people and the government, which is doing their job. But could you say something about the employers and workers? How are they dealing with with this, it's just business as usual. Nothing has happened. On their side, Shall I take there are no rave indications from workers or no requests from employers. Should, should, should I take it or Mohan? Sure, and Mohan, also open okay. your mic. Mohan. Yeah, Mok, your, your Mohan, your, your mic is off. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, very quickly. What did you mean um, when you said workers and businesses? What, what is the, 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 the question? I didn't quite understand that. I mean, the, the owners of, of the businesses, the employers, big companies, small companies, micro companies. I wonder if you have any informal sector there. And workers are just workers in each one of the categories. Are they yeah. protected, not protected, and, and they are reivindicating something, workers? Ah, okay. Uh, Carolina, you want to go ahead because... Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I can... What, I, what, I, what I've seen here is, again, like, I mean, Singapore has that 
you know, that ability to be so small and efficient that it kind of sets a, a quite a decent standard. What they've done is that they they just um, they just released the budget and they've done a big package to like support workers. So I've been seeing like I've I'm tapped into like the creative industries a bit and I and you see a lot of freelancers that would would normally be in a very precarious situation like freelance designers, freelance filmmakers, and the the government has all sorts of packages to support pe people that are even on you know self employed and freelance. So they're going to get some money. Um, at the same time, um, it has been business as usual until last week, pretty much, where there was an, a, a surge right after Europe started peaking. There was a spike here in imported cases. So the government stepped up all the measures. They said, OK, now we really need to start being careful. So just now you can feel that they're saying don't go out if you don't need to go out. But everything is absolutely running. and. What they what what the government has been doing they ha they they communicate every day with 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 an update and they're saying that they're really pushing for employers to let people work from home like for the first time they're saying okay now now it's really important that everybody takes some sort of distance um, but right now if you go out everything is running as as normal with the exception of movies and bars they literally closed this weekend so it's been four or five days where that stopped it's really. Um, it's been okay. And I would say that in Singapore, um, it's, I don't know. I mean, again, very, very um, personal view here. I think that they're, it's a very, very efficient and, and very run like a, like a company. So it, it, it has to be working. And I'd say lots of, um, I think it's not like in places where you have a traditional, like strong labor unions and that is just not part of the mentality. But at the same time, all of the senior government officials took three months pay cut to make sure that everybody has money. A lot of CEOs of companies are taking pay cuts to like make sure, for example, um, the Gojek, which is like the Uber here, the, their, their CEO took a 25% pay cut to pay the, the drivers that have less business. So you do see a lot of those examples where the people that, the, you know, the people that are making a lot of money are trying to distribute um, their wealth in a more um, equitable way. Okay, Mohan. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I mean, um, what Carolina said is absolutely correct. I'll add some details to that. Firstly, in terms of the budget, there were two phases of the budget. One initially that came up when the coronavirus uh, struck, and then it was in early February when they released, I think, about four to five billion dollars in Singapore dollars uh, worth of measures that was it was immediately uh, brought about to support <clears throat> businesses, a lot of uh, small businesses, you know, like taxi drivers, hawker centers, people who would be immediately affected by the drop in tourist revenue. So people who are exposed to the tourism sector who would be immediately uh, cut off from the lack of tourism, tourism money, tourism revenues, these were immediately supported and they moved the, the, the target a little further just about a week ago when the budget release was, I think, to the tune of if I'm not mistaken, Carolina, 52 billion Singapore dollars, uh, which now covers the entire uh, business sector. It doesn't cover the multinationals only to the extent of uh, helping workers who have been laid off, uh, supporting SMEs through rental and tax rebates, pushing away the tax filing dates to further to another date, uh, supporting small businesses in terms of their electricity bills, their, their utility bills that add to their overheads in running their businesses. And all of this is designed to help businesses hold on to their workers, not to fire them, but to let them uh, either work from home or stay at home uh, due to various reasons, whether it's self-isolation or stay at home notices or work from home notices and to make sure that nobody loses their job and no, nobody loses their revenue and their income. And this is supplemented by all the other structural uh, cost measures, right? you know, rents and stuff like that. So that is one aspect of the budget. And a friend of mine who works in the government did a per capita, uh, uh, per capita breakdown of this and our package is larger than the US package in terms of per capita support. Uh, I think it comes to like 11,000 US dollars per Singaporean, whereas the US package is at seven or 7.5 thousand 
US dollars per, per American. So just giving you a perspective of what they have done, and in terms of the, <clears throat> the impact that this has had in the government, in the, in the economy, what they pulled out of the reserves is about 11% of a GDP compared to the 9% that the Americans have put out. So that you can see it's a very aggressive uh, uh, approach uh, to the problem. Why? And that exactly suggests that they understand, they've understood the nature of the pandemic and the damage it's going to cause not only in Singapore, but elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere. So I have a little bit more to add, but I don't, be all, I don't want one to be the only one talking. Maybe you have uh, questions or comments, so I'll be very happy to answer. Uh, Carol, thank you. The floor is open to anybody who wants to comment or to ask another question. Can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Okay, yeah. it's, I, I will start with a comment and then my comment will lead on to, to a question. Uh, thank you very much to, to both of you for sharing uh, what is uh, currently being done in Singapore. I, I cannot help reflecting, of course, um, in contrasting what is happening in Singapore and to some other extent, of course, in, um, in other countries in Asia to what is happening in Europe. Uh, right now and it seems to me that what uh, you have uh, shown to us is that the population in Singapore trusts the government and they, they are confident that the institutions of a country can cope with the emergency uh, which to me is a major of course difference with what is happening now in particular uh, when I look at uh, the current discussions in France, I am particularly dismayed by uh, the lack of trust and the general sense that the authorities are totally overwhelmed or very much overwhelmed by how the situation is, is developing. So my question to you would be, to what extent do you feel that trust of the population is due to um, what they perceive to be the competence of the institutions and of the authorities? Or to what extent do you feel that this would be much more of a quote unquote, and I'm really putting this between lots of inverted commas, a matter of culture, of populations having been you know, brought and raised with a belief that institutions have to be trusted and not to be questioned. Is my question clear? Thanks. Yeah. Should I respond a bit to that? Go, um, go ahead. Okay. And before okay. you, you, you know what? Okay. You no, what? Okay. okay. But I find, I mean, super fascinating. I add a compliment I, to the seal question. The compliment is that what she said is also related to the privacy issue. Mm -hmm. It is because sure. in Europe we do not trust, in Europe and elsewhere, we do not trust the authorities that we open the debate on the privacy issue because we right. fear abuse of authorities. So that's also yeah. in the same context of Cecile's question. Go ahead. That's kind of, I mean, I mean, what, just to like, uh, to, uh, to add a little bit to this question, because I've been following very closely what's happening in Sweden, because my mother-in-law is there, and Sweden is, an, is, a, is also like a prime example of the op absolute opposite, where you do have a society that really, really, really trusts their government. They are free-spirited, and there's no way that they can't, they can't do contact tracing because it's a violation of their individual freedom. It's the absolute, up, but you know, it's like, it's exactly the opposite of what's happening in Singapore. You have extreme trusts on both sides, but the, the reaction in terms of like how you can effectively run contact tracing is 100% related to the issue of privacy. And this is why um, in Singapore, it was so easy to isolate cases. And in Sweden, they don't even, they don't even have credible numbers because they can't ask for your phone number, nothing. And, and, I, and I guess maybe it does go down to a cultural, you know, cultural issue in terms of like how you, how you, how you react to, to institutions. And I guess here you have to look at what, you know, like what, what a soft institution looks like in each, in each of these settings. Um, yeah, I don't know, Mohit, how would you add to this conversation? Well, Sorry, Carolina. Mohan. No, no worries. Yeah, I, thank you, Carolina. Well, I mean, um, 
in the Sweden case, yes, it is exactly what Carolina described it to be. Uh, but if you read the article that came out, I can't remember, a couple of uh, days ago uh, from, I think it was on the, in, in Financial Times about why the Swedish model is working. But there was a warning at the end that they're not testing, they're not tracing, they're not contacting, etc. And there was this little cliche that said, you know, there won't be any transmission because most Swedes live alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the yeah. transmission issue is not, a, not an issue. They're practicing social distances. But this then explains uh, something even more serious is the lack of, un a lack of understanding of the trans trans transmiss transmission process of the virus, mm -hmm. which is not taken into account in the Swedish context. Why is it different in Singapore is that we learn from SARS very, very quickly uh, yeah. that if you don't contain the transmission very quickly, you will get into trouble in the SARS process. And in this process with the corona, the transmission is even more deadly. It is faster, it's quicker, it's everywhere. It's just about everywhere. And it can infect you uh, anywhere. A, a, bus, a bus door, a car door, put your hand on the elevator, you can get infected. There was this understanding immediately. Why? Because China, when they when this work broke out, they shared the genome of the virus with Singapore immediately. And they were able to immediately look at the, the so-called the DNA of the virus and understood the nature of its transmission process, which then brought about what Karen explained later to really bring down very hard on what people to say, listen, this is what we need to do, get it going. Now, to come to now Cecile's question about how did they manage to do that? <clears throat> I'll take a step back and explain that. It's not just a question of education or forced education whatsoever in Singapore. It used to be that maybe the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. Singapore has moved on from that. There is, there is trust in the institutions here because they've always delivered. There's trust in the leaders here because they've always delivered. <clears throat> Because we do not have a situation where there is a black market, we don't, where p wages are so low, so there is no social security, and people are marginalized. We don't have that situation. Everyone is in the formal working se formal sector. So whatever benefits that are developed and shared by the government touches everybody almost equally. So there is this level of trust. I'm making it very simple here, of course. Huh? There is a level of trust in the society with the government. I'm speaking specifically about the trust issue, not about other political issues, speaking specifically about the trust issue. So there is a level of trust with the government. Now, we are faced with the pandemic, which is pretty serious. And we knew what happened in SARS, what happened with MERS, what happened with the swine flu, even though it was not a big deal. And when this pandemic came, people were alert and people immediately cooperated with the government to say, okay, let's do what we have to do. But what we had to do was very easy because there is a system already set inside here, uh, Cecile, and it has to do with our value system more than an imposition on the part of the government. It's a value system that says, we need to survive this communally. We cannot survive this individually. And this is a precious commodity in Singapore that has taken 50, 60 years to build. And it came about because of the trust that has been developed in the, in the institutions and in the role of the institutions in the society. That's how it worked. So it's been an extremely precious thing that has really paid off big time in Singapore in this pandemic crisis. There have been other crises also, but in this particular one, it has been extremely useful in, in containing the virus and all the things that we talked about before. I will stop here because there are a lot of other issues I could also say, but maybe there is a corresponding question. Uh, sorry, I wanted to say one thing, I'm sorry, regarding the issue of uh, trust, uh, uh, sorry, the privacy issues. <clears throat> this is such a small island. And 50 years ago, if I were to actually have this conversation with you, I would need permission to do that. I don't. Uh, we do not have an issue with people uh, sharing information about what the government has done or has not done whatsoever. We have no problem with 
our privacy issues being temporarily put on hold because it's going to save our lives. <clears throat> and that isn't, that isn't even the question because what privacy issues are we really talking about? This is a free society. Carolina lives and works here. She is free to live as she wants to, do as she wants to, and take part in society as she wants to. So I don't understand that the question of rights and the rights in, in Singapore has been, has been put on hold in that sense, if you want. I don't quite understand it. Uh, unless yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. I think in general, people don't have that sensation. It's not that you don't have that feeling at all, like in terms of our human rights are being violated. Like that is almost, it's like non existence. If anything, and I mean, speaking like I know so many foreigners here as well that are just feeling like, oh my God, we're so lucky. Like they're, they, they, they managed to get permanent residence and everybody is like, oh my God, Singapore has flown an airplane to the UK and brought my kids back so they're here. So we're all safe. It's just like everybody feels so protected by the government and their government is delivering. So everybody is super fascinated. But let me just go back to another, another, another small thing and you know, going, and going into like what, create, what, what, are the, what are the elements that creates that level of trust? And, 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 as, and as Mohan was saying, it's, it, you, know, you learn from past experiences. I thought it was really interesting to see that Africa had also learned from like Ebola and other crises and they even were more prepared than Europe in many, many ways. Like, People there were much more susceptible to, okay, this is serious, we got to get our act together. I think the problem that's happening in, you know, in, in Western Europe is that you have a bunch of free-spirited people that haven't been hit by a crisis in a long time and that we're not prepared. So, um, yeah, so I think there's a, a little perfect storm there that was a little bit different. And then um, nobody's used to being questioned to like how you're being questioned today, you know, like, oh, how are you counting your cases? Are you counting the people that died only in hospitals? Or are you counting? So why are your numbers not credible? Like all of these like questions were uh, questions you would ask to developing countries. I think, you know, Italy, France and Sweden and Norway, they're, they're all like, they didn't know what hit them. So of course it was a little bit more unprepared, regardless of the level of trust and regardless of, you know, how, how free people are. I think there was, I mean, you can see the, that people were just so unprepared and it comes from from previous experience can i ask there are other questions uh, yes i see david also please uh, 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 david, i don't know your name i'm sorry yeah sorry uh, i saw it's not written christian hape christian oh. from the fondation okay. Genève. we have christian and then david please thanks uh, do we talk in Singapore about the, the measure taken in Europe, especially do we talk about Switzerland, which is quite different uh, with the measure, measures taken in France and Italy? Uh, it's maybe in Switzerland like Sweden, where we can go out. We, uh, so I don't know, I wanted to know if in Singapore we talk about the measure taken in, in yeah. Europe. So I'd say that, um, well, there's, you know, this is, uh, I think the, the, the reactions to, to COVID is taking everybody's bandwidth and everybody is like taking a step back and just looking how things are unfolding. I would, I would, I would imagine, you know, if we, if we look at the, I think was it WEF that took, published their global health security report in December last year and it said the US and the UK were the best prepared for a, for a pandemic. Um, I think everybody is kind of like taking a back seat and staring what the hell is going to happen. You look at the, I think the US and the UK are taking the big bandwidth. Italy is obviously like at the top of the list. Switzerland, I'd say that here in Singapore um, is not getting out too much bandwidth because the, um, I, I think it's, a, it's relatively under control, but I do think that you have a greater level of shutdown than we have here. Like the schools where my kids used to be have been closed, are closed for seven weeks. Um, which is crazy, you know, like uh, th that's, that's just making it so difficult for people to work, you know, for parents to work from home, the level of lockdown um, is a lot harsher. So, um, and, and Sweden is the other case that's starting to get more coverage because everything is open and people are, are, are out. But as you say, there was a meme going around where you had a Swedish person standing on this side of the bus stop and a Swedish person standing on this side of the bus stop. And it said, this is what it was like before, 
COVID, and this is and this is the same picture. This is how it is now with social distancing. So yeah, you're right. There was a different type of spread there. All right, um, Mohan, over to you. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Christian. Um, I have to. I will answer your question in, in two parts. We are not talking about what is happening in Europe for two reasons. That if we were to talk about it, there is no good news to share. And you do not want to share bad news in a very, very in a crisis situation because it will only add to the panic of the population. Because never mind that Switzerland is considered the most organized, the most this and the most that, whatever, but it will add to the panic of the situation and it will point a finger to the, to the authorities and the institutions there as not doing a good job. And that's the last thing you want to do in an international crisis is to point, point fingers and say, this is wrong and this is right, or we are doing a better job. This is, I think, an the Singapore government is extremely careful not to walk down that path because it is wrong. What it has done is that it has very quietly uh, implemented, they call it the, the test kit diplomacy. So rather than look at who is doing better or who is doing worse? Singapore has actually uh, is is providing where it is needed test kits uh, free of charge to governments that have asked for them. I do not know, Carolina, if you've heard of this, but there is a bunch of people in a Singapore science and technology uh, organization called A Star, which is the government's uh, science and technology knowledge hub. They are coming up with a test kit, which I think will be able to tell you in 10 minutes if you're infected or not. I do not know if it's, it's almost there on the market or it's on the market. I do not know. It's almost there. And this test kit is going to be able, they're going to, they're going to provide it, of course, firstly to our neighbors who are struggling like Indonesia and Malaysia uh, and Thailand. Um, and then, of course, to countries that will, that will definitely need it. Maybe the USA, I do not know. Uh, so if, this is how I wanted to answer because it's not about saying this has been done better than here, better, better here than in Singapore or, or in Europe. Uh, I hope I've answered that question. And uh, David, uh, David had another question. Please go ahead. I'm, I'm curious to know how much news is disseminated. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes, now we can hear. Start again, please. So first, thank you for organizing this meeting. Secondly, I wonder how much news do you get in Singapore about what is happening in neighboring Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, not to speak about India. Because I think that we should not lose sight that sometimes quantity turns into quality. In New Delhi, where I lived for 10 years until recently, there have been, in the last weekend, more than 3 million people, that's almost half the population of Singapore, who fled the city, not because they were not aware of the lockdown, but because they had no money and nothing to eat. So the police and the army had to organize thousands, if not tens of thousands, of buses for these people to go back to their villages. And of course, on the same occasion, this distributes, if they are positive, it distributes the disease to thousands or tens of thousands of villages where there is zero health care or health service. But there was no choice because when people had no food, they said, I would rather not die of starvation than of some virus that some of us may or may not get and may or may not suffer from. I think the same situation, maybe with less severity and maybe a little less chaos, also occurs in Indonesia, which is just one hour's flight away from Singapore. Laos, my information is that in Laos, they have decided that they will start doing measures against the coronavirus only next week. Until now, they think it's premature. 
And next week, they intend to set some measures. So I wonder how informed you are in Singapore about Asia, other than the country itself, or the city country itself. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I understand. There are. I, I, I have seen several reports that are similar to the to to what you're saying, and. Again, even in even in in Sweden and in Norway, you had all of those rural hospitals panicking and blocking the roads in Norway because they don't want the, the people in the cities going to the to their summer houses because they are, those hospitals don't have the capacity either. But there is a there there is a lot of there is some coverage around the issues with migrant workers that are suddenly trapped and in in limbo because they have to leave the, the place that they're working and. There has been coverage of how this has been critical in in Thailand and in Indonesia and even here in even here in Singapore, when they closed the borders, there were lots of migrant workers that couldn't go home and the the you know it's been a mix like some some companies and some people and the government have to figure out where to house how, where to house the migrant workers that were actually contributing to. To, to the labor force here, but they were suddenly trapped and not able to go home. So I think th these situations of like, you know, in, in just forced migration, I guess you could say, um, is happening everywhere. And there is there is a relatively, you know, some coverage of that, at least here in the media. Mohan. <clears throat> uh, yeah, thank you, Carolina. We, we get a lot of news, David, from, um, from our neighboring countries because this is ASEAN. And there is information sharing through our news media radio channels. Uh, and we have reporters here and there, embassy staff here and there, which provide, that provide a lot of information about what is going on in these countries. Now, you mentioned those four countries. And um, what I want to say here is an observation and not a critique uh, of what is happening over there. So that it must be seen in that light, please, because uh, the news isn't very, very, very good. Um, just to take the case of Malaysia, which all of you know is an extremely wealthy country, when the pandemic was break, had broken out and Singapore was very concerned in mid-January, Malaysia decided to play uh, politics uh, in its government. And while they were playing Russian roulette about who should take power and which party should take power, the pandemic was growing in, in the society there was a meeting of some Muslim religious event in Kuala Lumpur, the capital uh, of, I think, if I'm not mistaken, covering number 16,000 people who gathered there and they had about three or 4,000 persons from Iran who came. Um, and some Singaporean Muslims had also gone there and come back with the virus. So the government was not paying attention to, to so this event that was, I think it happened in, in late February, but they were playing all these political games. There was no Minister of Health in charge. There was literally nobody paying attention to this. That's how alarming and shocking it is. Why is it so difficult? Look, 16,000 people in one area, half of them were Malaysians. Many of them had been infected from imported cases, specifically from Iran and elsewhere. Amongst the Malaysian refugees, there are the Rohingya, sorry, Malaysian people, they are the Rohingya refugees who have disappeared in society, no way to trace them. So Malaysia is grappling with a terribly, terrible situation, which is not evident in the news, but we know it because of what we get from people that we know. And this is why it is ex this is why they closed the border because they knew this is going to spread out and as carolina said the simulation workers who work in singapore have been housed the government has found homes hotel rooms whatever it is for them to stay in, paid for by the government singapore government um basically so that the supply chain between malaysia and singapore in terms of food water doesn't stop that's the that's the real politic of the issue and the worst problem is that we do not know, militia is not testing as, as fast as it should. Militia has a, medic, a medical doctor as health minister who's struggling to do, I think, what he, what he needs to do. Um, this is the case of militia. If you take the case of Vietnam, which is 
for other than Malaysia, Vietnam hasn't done a lot of testing. If you look into Facebook today, you'll find an article, I can't remember by who because it's my niece who shared it. Vietnam hasn't done a lot of testing, but they did the sensible thing. They immediately locked down. They cut off the airports. They quarantined anybody who came through during the Chinese New Year period. Anybody who was sick was immediately isolated and taken away. They really moved down to getting people to clean, wash, stay clean, wear a mask, don't come out. And they were able to, listen, this is not exactly a rich country. Yeah? I mean, they're wealthy in resources, but in terms of per capita income, it's not. They were able to more or less contain what is happening within, within their borders. And you have to take an example like that. So this is something that maybe other low middle income countries can learn from if it's not too late in, in what Vietnam did. So there are two contrasting examples here, uh, David, of a very wealthy country like Malaysia and Vietnam or at the opposite end of the scale. And look at the attention paid to the, to the, to the crisis. It's, it's telling a story and it's very sad for Malaysia. There's Indonesia and Thailand. I, I, I could talk about it, but maybe the other questions. I would just like to share one more thing relating to the question of civil rights versus uh, surveillance of disease. I have read that it is now known where the problem in Italy started from. The source of the dissemination to the Bergamo area, which was the epicenter, came from two events. One was a football game between the team from Bergamo and a team from somewhere else. And the Bergamo stadium was too small. So they went to Milan, to a big stadium of 40,000 people. And this is where the game took place. And this is where a lot of people were contaminated and brought it back to Bergamo. The second meeting was an evangelist meeting with people notably from the US who then carried it back to the US. So I'm telling this only to put things in perspective. If there would have been no surveillance and no analysis of big, big data, it would be impossible to trace the source of the problem. So while I am as sensitive as anyone else on the call to human rights and individual rights and whatnot, we live in a world in which big data is necessary in order to do any serious analysis and any serious solution. Incidentally, those that are working now both on a cure and on a vaccine are doing it on the basis of huge data of very, very many hospitals in incidentally in very many countries. So is that not in our interest to have a solution, a cure, and a vaccine? Of course it is. It is also our interest to have free societies. But I think basically the issue is not whether one should or should not analyze. The issue is that if there is no trust, then people will raise the human rights issue much more than if there is trust. And if people are hungry, then hunger will defeat the questions of ideology and uh, human rights principles. We've seen yes. it in India, we have seen it now in Italy, and I suspect that we will see it in very many other strange and wonderful places that have not yet hit the news. But there is enough from the news already to give us the pattern. And incidentally, I'm not even sure if we get all the news about China, because it fi I find it very strange that Wuhan would have been so severely infected, but Beijing, nothing. Thanks. Indeed. Uh, more I just, comments I just, or sorry. more questions? Carolina, please, yeah. Okay, no, I mean, just to, 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 to pick up on what David was saying, um, it's, it's very true on the, you know, the ability to trace things and how that has, you know, in, in many places it was, it was traced back to places of worship. You know, it was in Korea, was that, and here in Singapore, it was the same. And, and exactly as you say, if there wasn't some, some level of trust, um, telling people to, hey, you can't go to church this weekend, we're going to close everything off, would actually lead to like riots or like people feeling extremely violated, you know, 
of you know their, their right to to worship which is normally such a contentious issue yet here there's been you know there's and and i think almost everywhere i think i just saw like in the us a priest got arrested because he was doing throwing some massive um events still but in general i think i think People are, are, you know, trust that, you know, at the, at, given the, the magnitude of this pandemic, everybody just needs to, you know, do their part. And I think people get that, are getting it everywhere. Um, more questions or comments? Alejandro, I think you had a question before or a comment? I, I would like to... Uh... Go ahead, Enrique. Go ahead, Enrique. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, my, my comment uh, is uh, with regard to mainly economic consequences of, of this crisis. Uh, well, in Switzerland, I, I have heard that employers are, are asking that workers should come back to work as soon as possible. So this is dividing the, the, the administration in, in, in Switzerland. And also my other concern is my country of origin, Colombia, where, where the economic consequences uh, are, are going to be very, uh, very serious in my, in my opinion, uh, because uh, most of the employed people are informal, informally employed. They, they are just not asking for, for jobs, but they, they try to, to earn their living every day by going to the streets and begging or <laughs> selling uh, coffee or uh, fruits. Uh, so the, the, the independent people, the, those who make the living on a, a daily basis, they are suffering. They are suffering. And um, for example, a small town near Bogota, uh, uh, Soacha, most people uh, I, I don't know if you continue to, to hear me because my my yes we do yes we my, do go ahead we hear okay you. my screen disappeared well uh, these people uh, they go every day to bogota to earn their living but now they are uh, impeded to to they are not in a position to do that because there is no no transportation so my concern is what is it going to happen in the in a few months time two three months time and and i wonder whether the Singapore experience could uh, uh, give some hint on, on how, to, how to proceed. By the way, in Colombia, people don't trust government, uh, while in, in Switzerland, most people trust, uh, trust uh, government. Thank you. Alejandro, you wanted to compliment on this? Yes, it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a follow-up, possibly on the three last interventions. Uh, I have visited uh, Singapore for a couple of times, and I have always been impressed of the size of the port. I think it's one of the top three ports in the world, or something like that. And, and my worry is linked to what just Enrique mentioned. Uh, since the world economy is slowing down, since depression is already a forecast in most developed countries and most developing countries, so the world, the world's economy is going down. I guess that also the port of Singapore, the business will will go down, and of course, um, Singapore is a rich country, and I cannot help myself to make a a parallel with this famous book that we have all seen at bookstores: "Rich Parents, Poor Parents." How yeah. do parents raise their kids, and how do poor parents raise their kids? And I, I see a, a parallel with the government that is trusted when they are rich. And when the government yeah. is just when they are poor. And I wonder, and this touches to Sylvia Perret's story. I was going to show you. Sylvia. I was going to show you the port. Excuse me. Oh, that's the port. Did you see? But there you have the port. <laughs> they, they will slow down. And I was just wondering when I heard Carolina mentioning that two rich countries, Singapore and Sweden. In Sweden, they don't allow any breaking into their privacy and to, into their rights. But in Singapore, they accept it because the, the parent, the government is rich, the economy is wealthy. So I don't know if there's a trade-off between success and wealth with civil rights. 
with civil rights. That, that wonders me, that wonders me. And I don't know, we haven't spoken about women. Has women, what, what is the impact on women? What is the impact uh, in the economy first and then in, in women? Maybe there's, there's none because it's almost business as usual. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Mohan, you go. I'll, I'll, I'll say something after. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, quite a lot of things to take in there. So I'll see if I can consolidate what I have to say because uh, the, the questions are not entirely similar, but I think the answers could complement each other. Um, in terms of looking at civil rights and surveillance of diseases issue, I think this is a non-starter in a crisis. It is a non-starter in a crisis. We are in a pandemic. This is biological warfare. You can call it whatever we would want. Uh, people's lives are at stake. And when people's lives are at stake, no amount of economic wealth, upturn or downturn, is going to save you if you don't save people's lives. So that is the bottom line here. And look at it for those of you from the ILO. What we are protecting is not just um, people from being contaminated, we are protecting the workforce. We are protecting the productive force of the economy. You need, to, you need to do that. And protecting the workforce is not just persons going to work, but also the extended families, because this is all interlinked in the society. So this is the experience here that, okay, your civil rights are so, you have your rights as such, but if you want to continue to enjoy the economic benefits of the society, you need to be alive in this pandemic. If you come out of it dead, well, there is no question there, but the economy is gone, you're dead, you're gone. It's, it's another thing, right? But we don't want that outcome. We want an outcome where you come out of it, where you survive well, and you continue to actually co uh, contribute to the economy. Here, I'll give you a little caveat uh, in, the, in, the, in the budget that has come up, and Carolina will probably know about this. While people are sitting at home, and some may be working, some may not be working, given the different nature, the government provides training <clears throat> online, free of charge, under a program called the Skills Credit or Skills Future Credit. Everyone above the age of 21 or 25, Carolina, maybe you know this, 21, is given a $500 credit to go and train in anything that you need to. If you're working in the IT sector and you think you need to go and learn how to bake a cake, you can or if you go and learn Italian, you can. You can do anything you want that enhances your skills level at either the technical, social, personal, cultural, whatever, that keeps you continuously learning. So in this lockdown period or soft lockdown period or whatever you call it, it's not really lockdown, but people are working from home, people are encouraged to continue learning, retraining, acquiring new knowledge. So there is a process of keeping people engaged in, in, in the society in this cri under this crisis. Now, coming back to the economic consequences, I think I've mentioned that already. In terms of the port, listen, this is a transshipment port. Uh, Singapore port is a transshipment port. 90% of what goes on to the port doesn't even enter Singapore because it's, it just goes right through, right through, the, right through Singapore. Uh, there is a tremendous slowdown in, in, in the supply chain. <clears throat> and definitely this is going to affect everybody, not just Singapore, but everybody down the supply chain, wherever they, they're connected, whichever sector it is, whatever goods it is that you're trading, however it is transported, everybody is going to be affected by this. Now, the denominator is, is the same for everyone, isn't it? So one country coming out of this crisis is not going to help because the numerator is going to be very weak. So everyone has to come out of this crisis together if you want to see this, if you want to see growth as we had known this, but more importantly, I think, coming out of the crisis, that growth must actually translate into deeper socioeconomic expenditures by government to ensure health services and health sectors survive, workers survive, workers' families survive, people have access to water, what are all of those things that we all know. That, you know, without coming up with those systems in place, you are not going to be able to say that you know when the next when the next crisis comes, it is going to come. 
there will be another tremendous shakedown of this work workforce. I've heard some people say, you know, never mind, you know, it's the poor who get killed, who die. We don't need them because, you know, they don't really contribute. They are the black market and so on and so forth. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, for a right wing, right wing group who says those things, whatever, you know, but is this the outcome that we want? Is the question that we should ask ourselves, you know, um, Women's issues, I'll leave this to Carolina. Maybe she understands, she, she works, she, she actually is active in Singapore. Perhaps you want to talk about that? I okay, I, don't, I have like so many things I can, <laughs> I'm thinking in my head. Um, I mean, I think what Alejandro was saying on like the rich, poor, the rich dad, poor dad um, view of, of government is extremely interesting because it does, you know, it, it does probably play a, play a role in how and how a society um, interacts with their, with with those that are in power, but I and but I also feel that when we look at the way you know that we look at that that issue that this has been such a such a disease r related to rich people. You know, this is what you say and you see it in Latin America, in Santiago, the areas with curfew are all the wealthy neighborhoods because it had people coming from Europe. In Brazil, it was the same, and in so many, and, and even in, in Scandinavia, it was, you know, 45-year-olds who were skiing in Italy that were the, what, the ones, and so um, I find it really interesting to see that as a disease that has been, like, spread, you know, massively now in, with rich countries and a, among richer people that where everyone is going in a lockdown because you can afford it, that's also, like, at the heart of that discussion that we were saying that is taking place, like, in Switzerland, where you're, where you're, I, I know that my, a lot of my friends in Switzerland are telling me I'm fine. I'm, I'm, it's go, so polarized. Whether you're going to vote for like go for the health and lockdown, or you're going to go for the money and uh, to sacrifice and like you have to ignore the bodies and and keep the economy going, and that this has become like a very very polarizing view. And this is again, it's such a rich country, rich person discussion. If you can go into lockdown and chill because you have savings and like be on the internet. It's not, it's not rough. And we all know it's going to hit the poor areas like in a few months. And nobody's really taking any aggressive action because everybody's too busy with their own problems. And I find that almost shocking, right? Because it's going to hit refugee camps and it's going to hit the, you know, poor countries and in, 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 with levels that are just going to be so much worse. But everybody's just too busy with their rich, rich, rich spoiled kid problem in a way so that's one of the things that i'm thinking when when when, when, I, when alejandro was talking and the other thing just to address the women's issue um, and addressing um government communications because i think this is really interesting i mean one of the things that um singapore has been very very praised for is how the government has managed the communications you know when the prime minister speaks to the people is super clear the way the information government system um, the government's information system is get, is going out. It's being very transparent, very accurate, very effective at um, busting myths and like really um, addressing any sort of misunderstanding. And again, I don't want to point any fingers, but one of the really funny articles that I saw yesterday was one that was trying to um, was criticizing Malaysia. Let me let me post it here. Um, because the government did a campaign, a communications campaign that was um, responding to people in lockdown and it was really sexist. It was basically telling women to be really nice with their husbands, to giggle, to be soft because everybody's under a lot of pressure. So women should behave and be good at home. And this was the government communication. So we're like extremely sexist. So on one side, you have stuff like that that's affecting women. They have to, be, they have to behave when they're in lockdown because the husbands need to do serious work. And the other thing that, um, that's happening with this is, in, I've seen it reports in Australia and the UK, is that how the rates of domestic violence are spiking in these lockdown situations. So yes, it's affecting women. And, and, and also there's not too many women, again, at, th at the decision table when you see like the types of responses that are you know, taking shape. So, okay, those are like my five scattered ideas in response to the conversation. <laughs> Over to you guys. Uh, thank you, Carolina. Jean-Victor had a question or a comment um, a minute ago. Please go ahead. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. 
Um, hello. I'm uh, talking from Brittany just because I cannot go back to China. I have been stranded here for uh, since uh, early January. Now, my, my comment was um, the relative success we see in some countries in fighting the coronavirus. Uh, some countries like probably Singapore, uh, I would mention Korea and uh, of course what is happening in China. I, I don't feel it's so much linked to uh, contact tracing, which uh, raises a lot of issues uh, uh, in uh, Western societies. It's mostly related to means of action, to what is available to the government and to the people to effectively fight uh, uh, the disease or the spreading of the disease as uh, society. And I remember very well when uh, Wuhan, as you know, is uh, a city which has a lot of uh, links with France because there are big French companies over there and there is a direct flight, there was a direct flight daily from uh, Paris to Wuhan. Uh, the French residents from Wuhan who came back to to, to our country by, uh, let's say, mid-January, just for normal holidays, on arrival, they were amazed, and uh, this was recorded on TV, they were amazed at the lack of control on arrival. No one to check their temperature. Uh, no one was wearing masks, etc., etc. So we now have a situation in France where we are still unable to uh, equip people with protective equipment. Uh, we have no temperature checks outside, nowhere. And um, we even have no equipment to help people uh, breathe when they are in emergency wards, etc., etc. All of these equipment, facilities, controls, monitoring, which have nothing to do with tracing. I mean, it's uh, it just a uh, situation where it happens. Um, all these elements were and are present in uh, countries uh, like Korea, like uh, China, I don't know about Singapore. And, and this is a major difference. And this may be also why the people trust the government in some countries and in others they don't. They know that there are means of action and that the government uses them. Um, so these were my, uh, my comments at this stage. And just to, to mention, I felt this session very, very interesting. And thanks to, to you for allowing me to be in, and especially to Alejandro. A pleasure. Thank you very much, Victor. Other questions or comments? Anybody? Sabina, yes? Go ahead. Yes, thank you, everybody, and thank you to Manuela and Alejandro for organizing this meeting, and for Mo to Mohan and Carolina for their very interesting um, uh, interventions. Uh, there is one aspect that we didn't mention at all, and it's the intergenerational. Okay, you go to the and get your charger. The intergenerational tensions that this crisis might bring. Uh, we already hear before the crisis. We heard about, you know, the uh, the, the the elderly people, the the bo baby boomers got it all, and they had a good life. And the younger will have a less, uh, you know, less what compared to what their parents had. And now what we hear as well is that. Uh, the, the, the elderly people are more at risk in this crisis, and we are doing a lot to save their lives after all. The younger have less chances to, to be uh, hit in the hard way. So uh, the economy is at stake, and all these jobs for the young people, uh, will it pick up again? 
And so, again, I think that this friction between uh, we are, again, saving you elderly people and doing what we can to, to save your lives and uh, what will end up at the end, uh, will the economy and our job uh, come back to us? So I think that this is also an aspect that needs to be taken into consideration. Thank you, Sabina. Who wants to answer? Anybody? <laughs> Volunteers. Alejandro. I can just add because, because I couldn't agree more. Um, I don't know if you were informed, but actually the NGO Committee on Aging, together with Gray Cells, already two months ago, we submitted a proposal to avoid stigmatization and exclusion of senior people in all the processes. Everything is moving to e-commerce, e-government, e-communication. And now the way you're reacting to an epidemic as we are depends really very much on how you are linked to technology. So we were making a call not to get people uh, out of the real world, which now includes lots of technology. So, and, and also avoid stigmatization, basically, because all beauty products are already anti-age, and now all campaigns are anti-age or be careful if you approach an elderly people. There is a double balance there. Stay away to protect them, stay away because they are they might be dangerous or we can just spare them as many countries have very cynically said well just let them die they were going to die anyway so this is a, an issue that we just have to afford and there must be some guidelines at the global level i don't know un or someone to start a campaign also on avoiding stigmatization and possibly not joining race and attitude, but all of our dialogues and all our interactions are usually with uh, a senior person and a junior person in most of the cases. And now the responses, it's a very, very strong dimension. They have to be intergenerational and they have to be gender sensitive too, in my opinion. Who wants to reply from a senior or from a young perspective, Mohan, please. Um, <clears throat> it's just a comment, um, and I don't know if I'm if I'm I'm contributing in any way to to, to the issues that was just raised. But in the Asian context, th there is it, it's a cultural issue that you care. <clears throat> so you care for your elders. It's a cultural issue. You care for your elders, whether you are in a rich community or a middle income community or a poor community. The elders are always cared for. So. I, I think, Sabina, as you were asking the question, I, I thought this question was more, you, it, it better examined in, in a developed country context where there is this tension because of, of where the resources have to be spent at this, in this current pandemic. But then again, it, 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 it tends to forget that these very old people who, are, who need support are the ones who also have contributed to society's building and it, and it's and it's and it's and it's capital. You mustn't forget that. In the Asian context, I think that there is immediate uh, immediate reach out to the elderly and the senior citizens, and uh, basically that 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 crisis that tension doesn't quite exist. If it exists, it will exist only because there is a lack of access to healthcare for someone who may be infected and who needs immediate uh, help which would be the case possibly in Malaysia or in, in Indonesia and possibly in Laos because uh, really it's very, very worrying that you have not done anything there at all. And, um, uh, and, and Myanmar also because they only thought they'll be fine and nothing is happening over there. Myanmar is a very, very sad case. So I think that that is the only issue that I can see in, in, the, in, the, in the Asian cultural context of Vietnam. That would be an issue there because who then gets access to, 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 to help? Not that you have access, but who gets access? And here, of course, if you look at how governments respond, I think, I think at least in the Thailand, Singapore, and Malaysia perspective, anybody with a COVID-19 exposure 
uh, their medical cost is borne by the government. Uh, in Singapore, you, you, your cost is completely borne by the government. You get a payout by the government if you fall sick for the 14 days. I think you get a, I don't know, what is it, Carolina, $100 a day or something. I can't remember. And if you choose to leave the island right now because you want to go to USA to see your friend and you come back with the virus, you do not get subsidized health care. You'll be quarantined for 14 days with no help from the government. Then you will have to pay for your quarantine and then you do not get subsidized health care. So this is to dissuade people from traveling. You know? So these are our issues here. In the European context, I have many friends in Switzerland in Geneva who are angry at the lack of respect that is not given to the senior citizens of, 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 of the society because of the cultural uh, apathy that is now prevalent in the societies. I'm not saying this, my Swiss friends are telling me this. So I, 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 I reserve judgment there. Somebody else may want to, want to respond. Okay, well, I mean, I, I think this is yeah, a super sensitive issue and I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying that there's, there, there's this tension, of course, unfolds in different ways in different societies. And again, wealthier countries have more aging population and it goes in, the, in if we can, the reverse is also true. Everybody is like, you know, some people are saying, okay, good news for Africa, lots of young people, it's not gonna hit them so hard. I mean. It, it's insulting on both sides, right? It's not okay to say, okay, old people are going to die anyway, so um, we'll just, they're just going to have to suck it up if we don't have enough ventilators. And it's not okay to say, yeah, okay, these guys have a lot of young people, so we can just like, you know, relax for a few more months. I, I think, yeah, the complex issues that um, <laughs> have so many dimensions that need to be, to be addressed. But um, just to, to pick up on something, you know, again, the cultural aspects of how, how a society takes care of like the older generations. Of course, there are cultural differences. We can, again, look at Sweden where lots of people are mostly alone and here where people are, are, are actively being taken care of. But also just like the, the way that the health systems are set up. I mean, having lived in Switzerland, um, access to healthcare, even for people that can't pay for it, is 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 not so easy. They will, you know, and and it's like in Sweden as as well. If you have a cold and you're sick, you have to stay home. Like you'll only probably you'll only be admitted if you are like really, 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 really critical. And then of course, if you're really, really, really critical and and old, you're gonna get bumped the line. And this is how it is. You know, if you go to Switzerland, any emergency room with something that's not really critical, they're going to make you wait for lots of hours for wasting their time. Here in Singapore, again, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's much more easy. It's, there's more access for everyone. So again, I, I don't think that tension is as visible as you, as you can experience it in, in a country where healthcare is more, more rigid. You know, I, I mean, you go to Switzerland, you have doctors that just don't take new patients when everything was fine, you know? So there is a whole aspect of how, how easy, um, how easy healthcare is to ev everyone. So, yeah. Further More comments, questions, comments or questions? Mohan. Um, <clears throat> I want to, I want to, uh, I want to raise one, one, one issue with regards to the rights issue in Singapore, because, you know, well, this is the this, this discussion is all about this, but I want to tell you how, uh, that's such a fallacy. This whole issue of the rights issue being suppressed, and they say it's a fallacy in Singapore. Um, listen, this afternoon, uh, I heard on the radio just now, before just before we started this, that the 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 Minister for Law and Justice in Singapore, the Minister for Laws, they are tabling a bill in Parliament to ensure that people who cannot pay their bills on time. People cannot pay their taxes on time. People who cannot pay their rents on time. People who cannot pay their credit cards on time. Anybody who owes money to any institution or individual who can't pay on time because of the contractual nature of these payments will be exempt from persecution by law. They are passing a bill right now to ensure that nobody suffers the con because of the consequences of the of the of the virus, where businesses have shut down, people's incomes have been affected. The bill is passed to protect citizens who are unable to pay because of the crisis. Now, 
what can I say? Is this a rights issue? I'm more than happy to be here, you know, because the government is protecting my right not to be persecuted because of an event which is not of my doing. Now, how much more protection can you get from the state? And that. Yeah, uh, just to add to Mohan's yeah. comment, uh, right now and since two, three weeks now, in almost all European countries, starting with Italy, that was the first one, and then Spain today, and then France, UK, and so on, uh, similar measures are being implemented with some nuances, of course, with different cases. Uh, but I think uh, nothing uh, um, substitutes uh, the, the dilemmas that we raise regarding intergenerational tensions and regarding the privacy issues. I mean, uh, no matter what are the economic measures that European countries will be able or not to put in place, the, these two other issues will still stay on the table. I, I, I think they will not disappear anyway. So that's also part of the cultural and political context, of course, just to flag that. Any other comments and questions from anybody? Any other issue that you want to raise? Well, well I mean, I'm just, yes, I mean, just to go back again to the, like to the different, I mean, to looking, looking into like, discrimination in different contexts like there's a lot of talk as to how um, Asian Americans are feeling a lot of discrimination as an effect of, of this and that's a that's a human rights issue that the US will probably have to deal with I don't know to what extent that is visible in, in Europe but I'll tell you this as a as a person from South America um, having lived in in Europe and ha now live here I have faced much more discrimination in Europe than here and maybe it's because it's further away and you don't you don't have like a wave of latin americans you know being you know arriving on the shores that you like you did in europe but um i do feel that there is a there's a thing that's cultural that might be a little bit more you know transactional and maybe less emotional and passionate that you may have like in in you know like in italy or spain um but but it, but i felt that um the way that things work here is just it's it's quite pragmatic and it tries to be fair and and i think that this is these are elements of that are like part of the foundational elements of building that trust you know it's not it's like let's take and, and maybe that's a cultural thing you take the it, it it doesn't have to do with like a historical thing it doesn't have to do with like um you know with too much emotion it's really you know be, about being pragmatic and i think people trust that and i think that in, in other contexts, in other cultural contexts, there's like a different level of baggage, which makes it a little bit more difficult to, you know, to, to operate at, at those different levels. You know, like when you're going to put your, I mean, in the US, you can't even have like a national identity card because people go up in flames. And then this also just also the other, another issue that I've been like thinking about a lot, con contrasting Sweden with um, with um, with Singapore, for example, where you could say, okay, Sweden is like a you know is a country that's known for like a, having a very very powerful social safety net. So you could argue, yeah, you know, this is like a society that really really um, has like the social the collective as a as a priority. And in fact, the social safety net is so strong because you're so individ it's it's an individual individualistic society so you have that social safety net so you can be 100 percent individualistic and you don't need to make an effort for the collective because that's what the government is there for and here i think it's a little bit um the other way around i mean even though the government is there people are it's not an individualistic society it's a society that cares for the elderly it's a society that works as a community so if the government says we need to you need to sacrifice something for the greater good it's not such a crazy proposition as it is in a place like Sweden because you're not used to sacrificing your individual freedom for the collective because it, you never needed to do that maybe here um, it's part of it's something that is less um, less foreign so yeah just some extra thoughts to add to the mix <clears throat> very well said Carolina yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's not about about giving up anything <clears throat> anything at all it's it's in the culture here that you actually share that, uh, and 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 the, the outcome has been quite 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 substantial in the manner in which social capital has been built in Singapore. If you look at it, I mean, it is amazing that the levels of society which are 
which are targeted by the government, nobody is left out. And whether it comes to children's education, adult education, access to food, access to medicine, access to government services, what you consume in society, whatever it is, nobody is left out of this system. And look, this is, if, if, you, if you peel away the, the Singapore Asian identity, this could be Switzerland, this could be Sweden, this could be, I don't know, California. Uh, and then you put it back on, you, you see a lot of Asian people here intermingling with a lot of uh, foreigners and so on. The, the Singapore of the 60s is gone. I mean, I left, I left a long time, 40 years ago, and I've come back to a totally new country. And I came back four years ago, and I had to completely unthink all the prejudices that I had about the government when I left 40 years ago. And I've come back, I'll tell you, to a far more democratic, to a far more freer, to a far more safer, and to a far more um, uh, stable society than one that I actually have been living in Switzerland under, I mean, there are lots of good things about Switzerland, don't get me wrong, but there are so many frustrating things about the society, uh, which, is, which, is, which is, of course, apparent to all of you who live there. I'll give a simple example, it brings a, it brings a laughter to you. When I left the UN, it took me nine to 10 months to check out of the UN and Geneva, I came to Singapore, I was included in almost all aspects of society, social services, whatever it is, in 48 hours. It took me 10 months to leave Geneva and the UN in terms of the paperwork, getting my pension sorted out, yeah, 10 months. I came back here in 48 hours, I was reinstalled. I was gone for 40 years. In 48 hours, I got an email and I clicked on it and boom, bazooka, <laughs> I was connected to all the services immediately. I exist as a person. I had to call the tax department and tell them I'm back and they're like, do you exist? Oh yeah, wait a minute. You know, I mean, that's how it has changed in Singapore. So I think there is a lot of uh, misconception about the rights issue in Singapore. And as Carolina has said, this is so, 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 so different now. Um, I mean, try it. By the way, the, the Swiss authorities just sent me the letter saying that my permit is going to expire and that I need to fill out a form. <laughs> <laughs> I left three years ago. So it expires now? Only now? I have apparently. It a long time ago. <laughs> I thought it, I, th I, I, I sent an attestation to the part, the commute. I don't know why I'm getting this. I have to figure it out now, but I don't know. <laughs> But now I you mean, cannot love... come back to Switzerland. Be careful. I don't have any issues with Switzerland. I, Switzerland was very good to me, and and I thought, I, and I and I tried to be good back. So <laughs> I've always tried to be good back. So no, I don't have any issues. I'm happy wherever I land. But um, I, my God, I, I I can't. I've been so fortunate. Both countries and are have been amazing. So yeah, nothing to say there. Um, yeah. So, all okay. right, any other comments, questions, or, yeah, what's the, um, yeah? Uh, Mohan has something. Yeah, Mohan, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess we're slowly coming on to the end of the session, but I want to say something that uh, the Prime Minister had actually said at the G20 meeting that took place, uh, I think it was last week. They were invited in, uh, because we're not, Singapore is not part of the G20, uh, Malaysia is, and, uh, and, you know, he, he, he made a plea for, for international cooperation at all levels, you know, and it's not just at the health services level. It's not just uh, uh, at, the, at the talking to the big banks and to, and to capitals, uh, cap, capital centers about keeping the financial system afloat, but across the level, across the globalization level that they've been used to, not to let it down because it is the only structure we have that can guarantee international cooperation among states. We have a pandemic, we have a crisis, we have a biological warfare, and the response of the international community has been so terribly poor, <clears throat> so terribly poor. Uh, an example of how poor it is, is when you see how governments have to actually fly in planes to bring their own people back. You are raising the level of transmission, which is very, very sad. Why? Because there is no guarantee that your national studying or living elsewhere will be guaranteed the health care that they may need if they fall ill. This is the glaring truth of the lack of international cooperation. 
And he, he really looked he really looked to the G20 leaders to say, we have to get this together. There is no more such thing where uh, people from UNCTAD will know, but the multinationals keep calling the shots all the time. I mean, look, for not having paid taxes for the last 20, 30, 40 years, how have governments been deprived of precious resources to deal with such issues? You know, so uh, if you talk to other people, I think it's not just a Singapore plea. I think there are many governments who are asking for this. You know, it, it has to happen because, you know, the next pandemic is not far away. Not just because there's a second wave or the third wave, something else is going to happen. And where will we, will we be then if we do not cooperate? This is what I wanted to share. Thank you for listening. I think this is one of the issues that I'm pretty sure Michael Muller will raise on Friday here on that same chat. Uh, you are already invited anyway, all of you. It will be five o'clock Geneva time, so probably a little bit late mm -hmm. for Singapore, but it's probably worth to stay awake for, for yeah. that. Anyway, uh, over Alejandro. Yeah, you want to... Just a few final words, just to thank you very much, you, Carolina and Mohan, for sharing all your experience. This really uh, surpassed our expectations not in the terms of quality, but in course of time. We were thinking that possibly this will last like in one hour. We are far beyond one hour and a half. Thank you very much for you, for your participation. <laughs> and thank you very much for all participants. Maria, Christophe, Christian. Thank you, thank you really, very much. Yeah, and thank uh, you so much. Manuela <laughs> mentioned, I think it's gonna be very, very interesting, the conversation with Michael Muller. He has mm -hmm. a global perspective. And he is a multitask, phenomenal man. He's working in so many dimensions, and he promised that he would share not only his ongoing projects, but his new projects. And I'm sure that this uh, crisis has given him many, many ideas at the personal level, and the Coffee Annan Foundation, and with all the bodies that he's collaborating with. So thank you very, very much. Bon appétit in Geneva, and have uh, yeah. good dinner possibly in Singapore. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Mohan, we should connect. <laughs> if you're <laughs> Thanks, here. <laughs> thank you all so right, much. You. It was great to, yeah, great to meet you all. I'll hope to, well, well, we'll be in touch. And yeah, Mohan, we should connect. If we're in the same city, we're trapped on this island. <laughs> Merci à la Fondation pour Genève. Merci. Thank yeah, you. Merci. I learned a lot. Merci. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. Everybody. Bye. See you on Friday, five o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>